two, one. Excellent. I'm recording. I am with the great Don Tapscott. Don, how are you today, my friend? I am well. I'm excited to be uh, reconnecting with you. Um, you know, as a level set, I usually start with like, where did we meet? I met you, or sorry, I learned about you long before you met me. I read your, your book, uh, Wikonomics, uh, oh my goodness, a long, long time ago. And to this day, I, I, I attribute it to my open-mindedness about like open source. And so, so thank you for that. Um, I, but I think we physically met probably somewhere in Toronto, right? At one of the Bitcoin events. Yeah, I, I think so. Mm. Wikonomics, it uh, turned out, was a really big book. Um, Amazon every year publishes its top best sellers mm. in different categories. And in the management category, um, it was the number one management book for the whole year. It just squeaked out the black swan. Uh, so anyway. Cool. Well, that is... Yeah. That is a, definitely a feather in your cap. Well, like I said, I I that was, that was I read it well before I learned about Bitcoin, but that was one of those like kind of seminal uh, kind of moments for me where I started appreciating open source in a much bigger way. So I know we're tight in time today, yeah. so I wanted to kind of just dive right in, Don, um, yeah. and you know maybe spend the first 10, 15 minutes just really on your story, um, and then we'll talk about you know some of the exciting projects that you're working on now and and uh, some of the goals behind that. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, maybe if you can start. Sure, well, um, I was living in Edmonton uh, doing a graduate degree, Edmonton, Canada. It was minus 30 Celsius for 30 days in a row. I just couldn't get warm, but anyway. Born and raised, uh, by the way, born and raised, Edmonton. Were you? Yes, sir. Unbelievable. <laughs> I did not know that about <laughs> Anyway, um, and uh, when I graduated, I did lots of, fun things like I was a radical organized against the war in Vietnam and for civil rights and uh, um, women's rights, gay rights, you name it. And uh, that was in Edmonton, kind of a tough sell back then. <laughs> it was sort of, Alberta was the, uh, I guess the Texas back then of the sort of conservative um, political points of view. Anyway, um, and I ended up running for mayor of Edmonton. Really? As a, as a protest cool. campaign, yeah, there was a there was a real awful person running, and no one would take him on. You know, he thought there shouldn't shouldn't be unions, and women should be in the kitchen, and and uh, if you if you're a landlord and you find somebody's gay, you should be able to kick them out, or if you find out they're gay, you should be able to fire them. I mean, the guy was just awful on every issue, mm. and um, so I I ended up running and debating him in like 18 different debates. And I'm a pretty good debater, so he didn't get very far. Anyway, um, then I moved to Toronto and I had a graduate degree in research methodology in, as a psychologist. And I had two job offers. Mm. One was to be a school psychologist doing IQ testing. Okay. Harbor. And the other was to run a group at Canada's Bell Labs, Bell Northern Research, trying to figure out how the internet would change the world. Interesting. And I didn't get the school psychologist job. <laughs> so it's funny, you know, luck, I guess, is the intersection of preparation and opportunity. And uh, I got lucky. So we did this research. Uh, this is before managers used computers. The only people using computers were programmers, not even secretaries yet. It's 1978. And um, we came to the conclusion that Everyone's going to use a computer. They're mainly going to become a uh, communications tool. And uh, we, we did controlled experiments where we had 50 uh, managers and professionals using multifunction workstations connected to networks. And the other 50 were using the typing pool and pens and paper and calendars and calculators and telephones and, and so on. And we found out that the group that used the technology performed better and they had more fun. Um, <laughs> By the way, there's a great video clip about that period that I could send you. You might want to tie in with this uh, YouTube. Sure. Anyway, um, so I wrote a book about that in 1982, and uh, my mother bought most of the copies. Uh, it was like a study in bad timing. And the number one reason that people said this is never going to happen, you'd never guess it. They said, Don, this is never going to happen because managers will never learn to type. That's the reason the digital revolution was never going to happen. There's always a reason. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, 
And so I, I took a dozen people with me. I left DNR, created a company called Trigon mm. that had to do with the convergence of computing, communications, and content. Mm. And, Interesting. Uh, this is like 1982. And again, and so we set out consulting to companies on this thing that nobody even knew what it was. We made a go of it. And um, I wrote another book that nobody read. And then I finally wrote a bestseller in 92. And that was Paradigm Shift is obviously a big book. Then I wrote The Digital Economy in 94. And that was, I guess, the first bestseller about the web in business, at least. And uh, so I created a think tank. And I've been doing research uh, throughout that period, uh, a whole number of big syndicated research projects, multi-million dollar projects. And there've been lots of books, uh, some that my mom read uh, and bought most of the copies and others like Wikinomics that sold lots of copies, they were big uh, bestsellers. So that got, me, um, that got me up to the point where I started to think about crypto and blockchain uh, five or six years ago, seven years ago. W w w were, there, were there certain um, themes that, that struck you back then when you were seeing the internet in its infancy and then again in this kind of blockchain era? Well, the parallels are so obvious. Mm. Um, you know, as I, I said in my TED talk, which by the way, TED is an unbelievable platform. You know, that thing is growing at, at, like four years later at 5,000 views a day. Your video. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. My goodness. Okay. 5 million at Christmas. It's like 5 million, 300,000 now, 400,000. Uh, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. Anyway. Uh, that's my second uh, TED talk too. I'm sure hoping I'm going to do another one soon because I'm moving away to be influential. But as I said, you know, Alex and I kind of came up with this position five years ago that for 40 years we've had an internet of information. Um, but when I send you some information, I'm actually sending you a copy. Uh, that doesn't work so well for assets, you know. <laughs> if uh, you don't want someone copying your money, uh, or your your vote, or the or the uh, data in in your identity, and um, and if I send you a thousand dollars, it's really important that I don't still have money. So we came up with this positioning that the way that 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 we manage trust is through intermediaries that perform all of the business and transaction logic of every type of business. You know, they identify the party, they identify the asset, they clear and settle transactions, they keep records, and so on. And, They've done a pretty good job, but there's just so many growing problems with that model. And what if, you know, we had an internet of value, some kind of vast global distributed ledger or anything of value from money to music to a vote could be managed or transacted in a secure and private way peer to peer. So uh, we called it the internet of value and the trust protocol, because trust is not achieved by a middleman, it's achieved by cryptography and some clever code it's also a more secure platform sonny i don't know if you ever saw the the john oliver video uh where he had a lot of fun with my analogy where i said that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i've seen it i've seen it this is so hard <laughs> to pack is that it would be like a chicken mcnuggets very processed you know trying to turn a chicken mcnugget back into a chicken and he says whoa what a terrible thought <laughs> you can pick that clip up too but he says that would be one bleeped up chicken <laughs> suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the things I saw. Um, baka, baka. Anyway, um, so um, this is 1995 to finally answer your question. Uh, and, uh, you know, the internet has just come out. Only it's an internet of value. Uh, we haven't seen Amazon yet. Remember in 95, Google was years away. Facebook was a decade away. Um, and so we're still really in the early stages of this. And that has huge implications for everybody. It's big implications for investors, obviously, because the new Amazon is out there. Um, it's just been incorporated. But um, it has big implications for traditional companies too. Like back in 95, um, there were lots of great companies, Kodak, Blockbuster, Barnes and Noble, Nortel, you know, and they look pretty damn good. But if you had the lens of the internet and of the new digital age, 
you would look at them very differently. And that's happening today, of course. So I look at a company like FedEx that's committed to rebuilding its business around this technology. And I wonder, hmm, that's encouraging. Um, if I'm wondering who I should be investing in or work for or do business with. So, um, but it's also, it's 1995 and the internet changed many other things. It changed government, it changed all of our human behavior as well. So that's, yes, the analogy is a good one. So you do believe that blockchain will will change everything potentially again the internet of value i love it um and so anything else done on your story i know there's probably a lot more to it but given our kind of tight time constraint was there anything else you wanted to share before we moved on i know um you mentioned to me that you're I, I, that you've been doing some really interesting work with the biden administration as well so i, I wanted to get to that but i also want to cover you know the great work you guys have been doing in the industry um for the last sure. few years um well Around 2014, 15, I was on a ski trip with my son, Alex, uh -huh. and uh, over a very nice bottle of wine, a very large piece of beef, as I remember, um, we started sharing notes about crypto. Mm. And he was an investment banker, and he was responsible for all the Bitcoin deal flow for his bank. And I was working on a big syndicated project about how do we govern global resources? And we've been looking at how the internet is not governed by the state or state-based institutions. It's governed by a multi-stakeholder network. And I wondered, could that be the way that we need to govern Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? So I asked him if he wanted to write a paper for us. He wrote this paper, then the World Economic Forum got wind of it. They ended up asking us to write a paper about this for the forum. And my publisher got wind of all of this and said, uh, is this a book? And it occurred to me it was not about Bitcoin, really, because there had already been stuff written about that, but about the underlying technology as the internet of value. And so I asked Alex uh, one day, uh, crazy. Hey, you want to quit your big, high pan fancy investment banker job and come <laughs> with a book and get paid nothing with your old man? And he thought about it. And he's after a couple of days, he said, you bet, let's do it. So um, we wrote the book and yeah, it's a big book. You know, publisher says it probably sold more copies than all of the books about blockchain combined. It's in 20 languages. And it enabled us to launch the Blockchain Research Institute and a whole bunch of other things. Yes, yes. And and I don't know if you recall, but you spoke at one of uh, our events uh, a couple of years ago as well. You were our keynote speaker and we gave away, I think, 500 copies of the book as well to all the, all the attendees. It was such a great, great time. Well, you're um, showing great wisdom, Sonny, because mm -hmm. the best way to buy this book is in massive volume. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, hey, but listen, like maybe if we wanted to just shift gears into like, so, so I mean, that book obviously now has led to the work that you've been doing. And, you know, you've got from what I saw last, and I talked to Hillary as well, I interviewed her recently. I mean, you guys have, you know, almost every major relevant company, it seems like, uh, you know, it's supporting your cause. So how does one even like like go about that it was, did it just happen was it like all planned out <laughs> was it another uh, ski trip or no well the, the syndicated research model goes way back actually the first one i ever did was in 1989 89 and it was about the internet now we didn't call it the internet then it was about the integration of data text voice and image we had 100 companies sign up for that hmm. and i've done probably, I don't know, 15 or 20 of these big multi-million dollar programs over the years. So we did one on the transformation of government through the internet. Uh, we did one on social media uh, before it was really coming out. We did one on uh, information technology and competitive advantage. Uh, we did a big one on new network models of so solving global problems. And that's what the Blockchain Research Institute is. It's another one of these syndicated research projects and and the model is a good one everybody kicks in some money a hundred to four hundred thousand dollars over the years 
Um, and then you get 20 to, well, this one, we have like 70 companies. Um, you get a few million dollars and you can get all the best people to do research. And um, we've got a lot of really great people that have been uh, doing research for us. I mean, our work on smart contracts is done by Nick Zabo, who invented the smart contract. So um, we always try and, try and find the best person in the world to do this project. And then the, the results of the project, reports, videos, infographics, PowerPoints, data, whatever, they go to all of the members who paid in. And, and can you, are uh, you able to mention those members, a few of those like key members? Uh, you name a big company and it's a member. Of the so it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be harder to find ones that are not on the list. Well, most of the technology <laughs> companies, you know, like, you know, IBM and Accenture were two of the first in, but, mm. you know, Microsoft and, you know. So on. Yeah, Fujitsu. Um, and then we have a, a whole number of big uh, traditional uh, other corporations. I mentioned uh, FedEx is one of our. Any in India? Yeah. Wink, wink. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Reliance Industries. Reliance? <laughs> yeah. Huge. I, okay. Yeah, I got, uh, I don't think I'm telling stories out of school, but Mikesh Ambani, the chairman, uh, brought me into his boardroom. No. Yeah. And uh, I was all ready to sell him a $200,000 membership and said, no, no, no. Put the PowerPoint <laughs> away. We know all about you. We've all read your book. We want to rebuild our company around blockchain. We think we have seven or eight companies of our portfolio. We're going to start with Geo and our network, uh, our telephone uh, mobile company. We want to deliver blockchain as a service. And um, we want to work with you to make this happen. And I was like, duh, because you know who he is. Of Some course. people don't. He's the, <laughs> he's the it's the biggest company in India. <laughs> I think he's the last time I checked, he was amongst the top 10 wealthiest individuals on planet Earth, or maybe I'm mistaking, yeah. but. Uh... Something like that. He's got a 23 story house. Yeah, I've seen that one too, driven by it in, in Bombay, right? Yeah. Yeah, so okay, so you guys, and Ta was it is Tata? Or no, maybe I'm yeah, mistaking. I think there was a couple of other big names as well. Yeah, TCS is a member of the BRI. Um, where we uh, have worked with NASCOM over there, the big IT association. As um, and I've done a bunch of uh, stuff with them, a lot of uh, uh, speeches and so on. Uh, there's some other Indian companies there. I'll be, I'll be top my hand. Cool. Hey, and I'm um, keeping an eye on the time here as well. I know we don't have too much left. Do you want to maybe shift gears yeah. and, and uh, share whatever you're willing to or interested in sharing in terms of some of the recent uh, recent work you've done with the Biden administration, or do you would oh, you that, prefer just sure. a point? Uh, well, first I, of all, yeah. Yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Over the years. Um, for better or for worse, I've ended up consulting to uh, various administrations. So Clinton Gore, mm. and um, you know, I had dinner with Al Gore at his house, and he ended up being on the jacket, doing a jacket quote of the digital economy. I think it's probably the only book he ever endorsed. Uh, maybe not. I'd love to know if he endorsed another one. Anyway, uh, but um, and then I worked uh, for uh, Karen Reagan, who was the chief information officer uh, for George. Uh, Bush, Debbie, and then um, and then under uh, Barack Obama, uh, for Tony Scott, who was the chief information officer, and Tony actually ended up writing the foreword to this paper. So the paper was not solicited by President Biden; it was presented as, sort of as an open letter to him, basically. And it's a big document; it's 120 pages, and we argue that America is really at, uh, at a turning point right now, that a whole bunch of forces are coming together. The pandemic has accelerated the digital age. It's caused a giant economic crisis. We have a legacy of, of Donald Trump on, on the legitimacy of the democratic system, which is a, a big, big problem. And on the other hand, we have information technology, the digital age entering this second era. Blockchain, as we call it, the trivergence of AI and machine learning, the internet of things and blockchain, the data sort of being the thing in the center of all of that. And we argue that the US needs to take a 180 degree turn on a bunch of topics. Um, the very first one was America should be the first country in the world to, uh, to have self-sovereign digital identity. Uh, we have digital feudalism right now. The virtual sunny knows more about you than you do, but you can't remember what you 
bought a year ago, your location a year ago, what you said a year ago, what medication you had, what diagnosis you had, what you got to test, or who you interviewed. <laughs> and the trouble is that you create this this mirror image of yourself, but it gets captured by these digital conglomerates. By the way, a very good turn from a 2006 paper that was terribly prematurely timed, but um, that's what they are. They're a new species of business. That, and uh, if you, if you uh, go, go to dontapscott.com, you can read that paper about the digital conglomerates from way back then. But um, so we need to have a self-sovereign identity. We need to get this data back so that we can monetize it ourselves, so that we can protect our privacy, so we can have the data to plan our lives, um, and uh, we can manage this data responsibly for ourselves. We could also have agreements to have anonymized data used in a crisis, like say a pandemic, where we don't have access to health records because it's all buried in these silos. So that was one of five things. Second big one, of course, of interest to your audience, is we said need a 180 degree turn on cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, interesting. Okay, please, I'm, I'm, you've got my attention. Well, we said the attitude about Bitcoin generally is hmm. wrong. You know, Janet Yellen saying the main transaction use of Bitcoin is crime. That's just factually wrong. Um, they should have a big turn on, and they, and and all the legislative environment is is inappropriate they it's a tough time to be a legislator you know because you have to get the balance right between protecting investors and the public on the one hand and encouraging innovation on the other but that balance is wrong today and um we also said there's a role for corporate currencies like dm facebook's uh, dm interesting um, they should be cautiously embraced and we said the U.S. has got to get cracking on the digital dollar. And I see this article in the New York Times yesterday on how China's charged the head now is for yeah. implement. This is now New York Times stuff. The, the China's way ahead of the U.S. So th this is uh, wake up time. Mm. You know, lawmakers have got to get up to speed on this, and they've got to have a new attitude because they're. They, their attitudes, their laws, their regulatory bodies, their regulatory leaders, their institutions are all locked into this old model. Other, the three other things, just the sentence in yep. We argued we need a digital Marshall Plan to reinvent the U.S. federal government's IT operations. Yeah. Uh, number four was hmm. that we need to um, take a whole bunch of steps to um, build an innovation economy uh, in the United States. And that, that economy needs to be open and uh, it needs to be accessible to everybody. We need to ensure entrepreneurship and uh, rekindle the sort of uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit. And so was that five? Uh, digital identity, uh, crypto, um, uh, um, uh, the digital uh, Marshall Plan, rekindling uh, the economy, and uh, those. That's that's awesome. Hey, I think hey Don, I captured Don, them all. Don, um, you know, just curious. So, uh, uh, you're in a very interesting position where you're like literally in the middle of all these large, major organizations that are obviously very impactful in everyone's lives. You've looked at this problem set from the through the lens of blockchain and how it can not just solve money but can solve maybe everything or, or a lot of things um i'm just curious to know if your perspective on bitcoin let's say specifically has evolved over the last five years and 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 similarly with with like the world at large and i mean the world as in like these big big companies was it kind of like we'll never touch that to now maybe getting them them a bit more warmed up and, and how has that journey looked i know we don't have too much time but but just really yeah. curious well i'm um, bitcoin per se um the subtitle of blockchain revolution was how the technology underlying bitcoin uh, will change money and the world yeah um, it wasn't how bitcoin will change money in the world but um, I know both um, Alex and I didn't mean to imply that Bitcoin wasn't important. 
important. In fact, Alex has now launched the Bitcoin Trust, and um, which is a uh, basically a fund, and he bought he bought into Bitcoin with pretty impeccable timing. So he's got a bunch of very happy uh, customers right now. But um, you know, Bitcoin is the kind of flagship of this whole thing. Sure, you know, you got platforms like Ethereum that can do smart contracts. Then you got all these new amazing platforms that, you know, I think about things like Polkadot or, um, you know, Cardano, uh, Cosmos, the internet of blockchains that are all, uh, we're actually analyzing all three of these right now. And they're, and they're, they're each very interesting uh, in their own right as, as sort of a new operating system for a whole new kind of economy. But, um, but Bitcoin continues to have a whole bunch of important use cases. It is a store of value that, uh, you know, it's going to be really volatile, um, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to imagine how that's not going to continue to go up over time. I remember um, back, it was about three years ago, Bitcoin was trading at $400, $300. And um, Coindesk asked Alex and I to make predictions, which we never do. But <laughs> Alex said, let's do it. And let's make a really tough prediction. Okay? okay. So we predicted, we said, next year, Bitcoin will surpass $2,000. And everybody, everybody <laughs> was like, these guys have lost their mind. I mean, they wrote that really good book. And that was a great TED Talk. And yeah, they got this institute, but they're nuts. So as it started to get later into the year, Bitcoin did pass 2000 and then it went to 19. So um, we were really wrong by an order of magnitude. The other way. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember, but there was, I remember one time we were at a bank or something, really high up floor. You gave a presentation to a room full of people and I had asked you something similar. It was years ago. And then, and then one more thing before we just end up, I wanted to say thank you for connecting me to the OECD. And, and uh, there was a lady that, that you had had me speak on stage with. I don't know if you remember, but uh, it was a really, really tough time in, in kind of UnoCoin's journey. And yeah. you just you just said, Sonny, go on stage. There's going to be people yeah. on there. I just want you to say the truth and just yeah. speak your heart. Yeah. And that was why I was like, man, that's why I love Don. He's He knows what's up. And so I ended up going to Paris and, and sitting in a room with, right. you know, <laughs> with the, and I get, yeah. I get to speak as well. Sorry, sorry. Don. But any any finishing things you want to share up? Again, I don't want to take up too much of your time because we're at the end of well, our half hour. But uh, yeah. You know that... I hold a lot of hope for all of this technology, but ultimately it's not technology that improves the world. And the world does need improving. I mean, this is a mess. The pandemic has accelerated what a mess it is. Um, it's, but it's also exposed a lot of weaknesses in our systems, our supply chains, our systems for uh, health data. There are uh, leaders that have failed that will be replaced or have been replaced. I think that's part of what brought down Trump. Um, and when the dust settles, uh, the technology is not gonna fix things. But what it does is it gives us another kick at the can, you know, because the internet of information did lots of great things, but it, it's, it's contributed to a bunch of problems too. Mm. You know, we have our privacy is being undermined. We have this problem of data that I described, um, we, it's cr created a fragmentation of public discourse where we're all in our own little echo chambers. And the, I think the purpose of information for many of us is not to inform us, it's sort of to give us comfort for our preconceived ideas. It's enabled people to create false theories and narratives for all kinds of things. And we get support from them, including the first while president of the United States. And, um, and lots of other stuff too. But so now we got, a whole, we got an internet of value and with the trivergence and the second era of the digital age, it's not gonna solve problems, but it gives us another kick at the can to rewrite the economic power grid and the old order of things, uh, but only if we will it. And I think ultimately um, 
it's a great passion of mine uh, that that we're going to need a new social contract. You know, because we, when we went from the agrarian age to the industrial age, we figured out a bunch of stuff and we built it into the contract between government and its, its people and private companies, civil society and so on. I mean, we figured out that um, people needed to be literate. We created the public education system, a law. You have to go to school, it's a law. Um, we created, um, a social safety net. We knew that people are going to live in the cities. They wouldn't be able to do subsistence living. Uh, we figured out that you can't have an oil company own all the oil. We figured out if, if we're going to have publicly traded companies, they ought to tell the shareholders something once a year. They didn't have to do that prior to the SEC Act of 1934. So as we move into this next era of the digital age, I don't think we've got any of that figured out. We're going to see structural unemployment, not because of the pandemic, but you know, look at 48 or 50 states, the number one job type for men is truck driving. I think that's gone, in, not, not in a century, in a decade. Um, we have this problem of data. We have the notion of prosperity. You get prosperity through a job and, and the, the American dream is so on, but it's for the first time in modern history, the economy is growing and the middle class is shrinking. It's not just the pandemic, it's pre-pandemic. You know, we have wealth creation, we have uh, declining prosperity. What a weird situation, you know? There are many, many problems. And um, so if you Google my name and new social contract or the declaration of interdependence, as I call it, uh, you'll pick up uh, a bunch of stuff on that. The other thing I'll tell you is uh, the big topic I'm very passionate about right now is, is getting our identities back, the self-sovereign identity. I think that's right up there with climate change. I mean, we need to turn back the tide on climate change or we don't get to have humanity, okay? But we need to turn back the tide on data and recapture our identities or we don't get to have a civilization. Because I think that that owning our identity, having autonomy as individuals and having privacy and the right to, to be alone is really the foundation of freedom. And if we lose that one, you can kiss civilization goodbye. So I'm very, very passionate about this. And we're doing a lot of work about this and expect some big writing on this soon. Okay, well, Don, I mean, I just just before I do let you go, what is the website uh, for the BRI so that people can, you know, go to it and learn more? Block, blockchain Research Institute. Beautiful. Dot, Perfect. Dot and then um, dontapscott.com. They just built a new website that sort of goes back to the 70s. And, and the name of the book, Blockchain Revolution, right? Yeah. So that, that the name of the book as well. So people should go buy that from. Well, and that, <laughs> but we have these two new books out now, too. So I've, uh, I've done the editing and um, uh, pu putting together the book Supply Chain Revolution. That's the first book that talks about supply chains and pandemics. And Alex has got this gorgeous new book called Financial Services Revolution that, boy, if you read that part that he wrote in that book at the top of your head doesn't blow off. <laughs> it's, it's the most profound analysis of the financial services industry and how it's about to change. Hillary sent me that copy, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to pick that one up uh, and start reading it. But I'll put it on my list. Uh, okay, so Don, this has yeah. been splendid. Far too short. If you have time in the future, you're always welcome back on. I'd love to go down some more threads here and there. We kind of yeah, zip sure. through it, but I'll take what I can yeah. get. So thank you hey, very and, very much. And I hope everyone will go to uh, blockchainresearchinstitute.org to get the Biden report. It's right there, free. On the there you go. Okay. So the Biden reports on there. Awesome. So people can pick it up. Thanks again. Okay. Lovely. All right. We'll talk again soon. Bye.